If you want to understand the two world wars and the third coming up, you must understand Switzerland, the Knights Templars, the Order of the Garter, and the internal war within Pharaoh's nobility. So here it says, internal war of the nobility. Within Pharaoh's nobility, there are basically two parties, the Royalists and the Republicans. The Royalists want the old world order, vertical rule of the feudal system, with just one king, Pharaoh, master, giving all the directives and all the orders, and they don't want to mix all the peoples, races, and religions. Their main adversary are the Republicans. New World Order, horizontal rule, founded by the Knights Templars, who are also Pharaoh's nobility. And they want to mix all peoples, races, and religions, because when all peoples are mixed in a country, then the people will have no more ancestral identity, saying, for instance, we are English. This is our country, our heritage, our language, our physical appearance, our religion, and we won't take any more orders from Parliament and their centralized government. So here it says, Order of the Garter. So for Pharaoh's nobility, it will be much easier to rule over a mixed breed of slaves who consequently don't have those nationalistic issues anymore, like self-rule. So here on this side, you see the Order of the Garter, where it says, Oni Swaki Maripans. It's a very old picture, probably from the 15th century, or maybe 14th. And here it says, their plan. And on the other side, it says, between quotation marks, happy humanity. And here you see a melting pot uh, family. And here you see, of course, the um, checkerboard configuration of the Freemasons. So their plan, happy humanity, between quotation. For myself, I don't mind if you want to mix yourselves up or not. I'm neither left-wing nor right-wing. I just hate the evil idea of total control behind it all by our pharaonic masters and their order of the garter. So here it says again, Oniswaki Malipans, the order of the garter, their plan, and between quotation, it says, happy humanity. And you can see here a melting pot mixed uh, happy family. As the old monarchies of Europe, like Germany and Austria, didn't want to accept the new and literally revolutionary rule of the horizontal Republican Templars and their mixing up of Pharaoh's slaves, World War I started with World War II as a consequence and even more difficult to understand if you don't know about the nobility's internal quarrel. So you see the German, here it says, German nobility and its emperor. Here's the, the German emperor. And uh, here they got all these cheese picks on top of it, you know. Yeah. The Second World War was most of all a war of putting, or trying to put, 
the German Emperor Wilhelm II back on the throne and restore the German monarchy from the New World Order Horizontal Republicans, as the German Emperor got abdicated in 1918 at the end of World War I. So here we can see the Emperor on his throne, and it says here, another world war to put the German Emperor back on the throne which became World War II, which is the real reason. I mean, all the reasons for all these wars are to be found in Pharaoh's nobility and most of all, their internal wars. And as there was such tremendous hatred for one another within Europe's nobility, the German emperor and the German high nobility said, OK, if you want to mix all peoples, all races, and all religions in my German empire, I will show you once and for all, with a final solution, what we will do with that idea. So here it says the Emperor's Totenkopf. So this symbol here we know far too well from World War II about the uh, SS Totenkopfverbände and the SS Einsatzgruppen doing the final solution and other things. It's already the same symbol, you know, during the World War I. So that means this symbol is not from the German people, it's from the nobility, from Pharaoh's nobility, wakey, wakey people. So, and here you see the octagon, here the, the pharaonic sash, Templar's cross here, Templar's cross there. And here is the idea of the other ones, you know, the, um, the order of the garter. And this is a, a melting pot American, uh, happy family. So, and these ones here, they didn't like that, you understand. And this all led to the final solution because the new world order, they want to mix everything, and the old world order, they just don't like the idea. And this is the main reason for the whole catch, which word I may not pronounce because of the global censorship of Pharaoh's New World Order dictatorship. One is not allowed to say anything anymore about the whole catch if you don't want to go to prison. And even the pronouncing of the word for the whole catch will have your video immediately censored, or if you write the word in the title. So I chose the word whole catch because it sounds phonetically similar and starts with an H. Whole catch means they caught them and put them in a hole. So here it says the whole catch and here censorship vocabulary. So the whole catch of World War II was not a result of racial hatred by the German people, but the whole catch was a direct result of Pharaoh's nobility's internal war between the new horizontal rule and the old vertical rule. So here you see the German Emperor Wilhelm II. Here is a Templar's cross, and here it says Gott mit uns, which means God with us. Well, my question is is God with the German people or with these ones here? Right. And in the Nazi army, they had this on their belt Gott mit uns. So here it says, nobility's 
internal wars. And here they're standing with all, all standing with their sabers here and their sashes and their octagons and, and Templar crosses and whatnot. The German emperor said, I'm happy with my German slaves who do their work well, who are obedient, who believe everything I tell them and who just need a beer or two in the evening to be happy. I don't want all those jaywalkers in my empire who don't even work as their men don't work and pray their holy books the whole day. So there are no men hours made in these communities and consequently no taxes to be deducted and extracted to hell with them. Altogether with the Bohemians who don't work either. I say here Bohemians as the censorship probably won't allow me the usual word to address them with. You know, these boys and girls who are traveling with caravans. You know what I mean. I've got nothing against the Bohemians. I've got nothing against these people. And neither do I have anything against these jaywalkers whom you can see, see here. Here it says, no man hours for Pharaoh's nobility. You know, for Pharaoh's nobility, a person's life is being measured in man hours and how many taxes can be extracted in this autosufficiency slave system of Pharaoh. And if the subjects refuse to work, like orthodox jaywalkers or the bohemians, they automatically become useless eaters for Pharaoh's nobility because they can't be parasited on by the masters. Same thing happened at this recent rave party of October the 7th, 2023 in the desert, where some useless eaters with long hair and taking drugs were sacrificed by pharaohs, politicians and betrayed by their own army. Similar to the Friday the 13th, 2015, Paris Bataclan sacrifice of similar long-haired heavy metal fans full of drugs and similarly defined as useless eaters for Pharaoh. Anyone recognizes the same pattern? Huh? So here it says Bataclan. Uh, the name of the band was Eagles of Death. There was a metal band. These orthodox jaywalkers and the Bohemians were the poorest people in Europe who refused to work and integrate into Pharaoh's civilization and consequently pay taxes to Pharaoh's nobility. So they were of no more use to the masters and had to go. So here you see the jaywalker, he doesn't even have shoes. Here you see the bohemians, no shoes either. Well, these got nice boots, eh? These ones too. Here it says, no money to be extorted by Pharaoh. And Pharaoh saw them as useless eaters. And Homi Ross is also being considered a useless eater by Pharaoh and their Swissies, because there are no taxes to be extracted, and Homie Ross refuses to work for Pharaoh, although Homie Ross works very hard 
making lots of historical documentaries for mankind and our freedom. It says, Homie Ross, no man hours for Pharaoh. This, and only this, is the true essence of Pharaoh's slogan, Arbeit macht frei. If you don't work and don't pay taxes to Pharaoh's nobility, then this is where you're gonna end up. A place for useless eaters of the old pharaonic slavery system. The slogan Arbeit macht frei is not by the German people, but from the Aryan masters of Pharaoh's nobility who keep humanity in total slavery and keep them working for them in the new pharaonic slavery system of autosufficiency. And if you don't work and don't join the autosufficiency slave system, then you'll end up in the old slave system, as you can see here, where it says Arbeit macht frei in one of Pharaoh's camps. So for those who refuse to pay taxes to Pharaoh and don't comply with the new Pharaonic system, like Homi Ross, like the Orthodox jaywalkers, like the Bohemians, like the long-haired hippies or rave partiers, well, then the old Pharaonic slave system will be applied unto them under the slogan Arbeit macht frei. So, in fact, Arbeit macht frei, it means work and you will be free in the new slavery system of the autosufficiency system, where it seems you are free. And, you know, this is something only Pharaoh's nobility could invent. This is why the German Old World Order nobility came up with this identitarian Germanic propaganda in order to unite the German people into a war, which was not theirs, but an internal war of Pharaoh's nobility. Who are the real Aryans and master race in this equation and false flag operation? As in the demotic scriptures of Pharaoh's language, Ah means big or pregnant, Ri is the sun, and On Osiris, Ah Ri On, meaning we were born out of the sun, we are not from here. We are the master race, the pharaohs of Egypt and their descendants of the entire European nobility. So here it says, A ri on, ri is the sun, and A it means big or pregnant. So this means they're born out of the sun, being born out of the sun. And here you see uh, the British nobility, here the um, emperor, the German emperor, and who are in fact one and the same family. They both have Queen Victoria as an ancestor. You know, we're being ruled by one family, the Per A, which means the big house, out of which the word Pharaoh comes from, Per A. This here is the big Per A. And they all got the octagons and the Templars crosses and the sashes. He has a red sash, a golden sash. It's all one and the same. So here you see the no Pharaoh's nobility. And it says royalists versus republicans. Because most noblemen, they only see these two parties. They think most of them, they think they're only royalists and republicans within 
Pharaoh's nobility. And then within the nobility, there is in fact an obscure and even more occulted party, which even most members of the nobility themselves don't understand, as most noblemen only see the royalists and the republicans. This third party is the Order of the Garter, which is an even more elitist group and a so-called compromise between the royalists and the republicans of Pharaoh's nobility, which I've already explained you in my previous videos and much more. So I don't have to repeat that and the basics of things. So here you see the Order of the Garter with their cloaks and all this, here the checkerboard configuration. And here it says, third party, Order of the Garter. So next to royalists and republicans of Pharaoh or within Pharaoh's nobility, there is a third party, the Order of the Garter, which is supposed to be a compromise. But what most noblemen don't know is that the Order of the Garter is in fact a wolf in sheep's clothes, also called a psyop nowadays, because they're entirely controlled by the New World Order Templars of the Octagon and the Swissies, in order to confuse the nobility with the noble idea of a compromise, whereas the compromise in reality is a Trojan horse. So here it says, Oni Swakimali Pals, uh, the Order of the Garter, and here is a Knights Templar. On the left hand side it says the Garter, short for the Order of the Garter, also sometimes called just the Garter. And on the right hand side, the Knights Templars, and they are the same. The Garter is the Knights Templars. So the Order of the Garter was supposed to be a compromise within the nobility of the Republicans, the new Templar system of the horizontal rule, and on the other side, the uh, monarchist or royalist, the, the vertical rule of the old feudal system. But in fact, they are still the ones even controlling the Order of the Garter which was their idea in the first place, these ones here, to make a compromise, but they kept the Trojan horse inside. And this is where it gets very tricky. Only with this knowledge one can understand the betrayal of Adolf Hitler towards the German nobility, who were all big pals standing together in the beginning of the war. But then the German nobility tried to liquidate Hitler at the end of the war by Count von Stauffenberg in 1944 and the organization of July 20th. Here we can read the list of members of the July 20th plot in 1944 here, when at the end of the war the German nobility and a lot of high nobility, they understood um, that they were betrayed by, uh, by Adolf Hitler. So even if these ones here, they don't have the von, which in the German nobility normally, uh, you know, if there is this von, you know they are of the nobility. You know, a diplomat, of course, you know, and it, it's a count, this one here. It says Graf, Albrecht Theodor Andreas Graf von Bernstorff, uh, Bern, capital of Switzerland. So if there is this von, you know, you know, they're of the nobility. But even these ones here, without the von, 
They are probably also of the nobility because this one is a colonel, a general, a lieutenant colonel here. You know, it's all it's all pharaoh's nobility anyway. So here they conspired against Hitler and they all got here, you can read here, he got executed, executed, hanging, firing squad. You know, the count, yeah, he got uh, in 1945, in all 1944. Um, this one survived. Maybe he wasn't of the nobility. Well, he was only a colonel. Eh? And so Gottfried Graf von Bismarck, you know, the count. Well, he survived, funny enough, eh? Von Blumenthal, he got executed in 1944. Von Böhmer, he got hanged in 1945 by the Nazis. So all these aristocrats, they all got executed by the Nazis. You know, it's quite funny, eh? I'll explain it to you. Von Böselager, killed in action. Von Böselager, oh, he survived. Uh, he got executed here, executed, executed. He got shot, hanged, hanged. Um, so, yeah, more oh, nobility. Von den Buscher, Freiherr, nobility, you know. Uh, Canaris, yeah, he got hanged, hanged all in 1944. Um, so you read it yourself, yeah. Tudona Schlobitten, also nobility. He got hanged from Donani. Uh, he got hanged in 1944-45. Uh, von Falkenhausen, Freiherr, nobility. Mm. He got hanged here, a colonel, he got hanged. Von Loringhoven, Freiherr, nobility, he got hanged. Graf, a count, Fluger von Glött. Uh, Gere, he got hanged. Von Gersdorf, survived. Actually, a lot of the nobility, they survived, eh? He got hanged. Yeah, Freiherr von und zu Gutenberg. Uh, he got hanged in 1945. Von Heften. He got hanged. So another von Heften. He got uh, firing squad in 1944. So even at the end, you know, at the end of the war, you know, of 1945, you know, they, they, they just wanted to murder them, you know, just at the end of the, uh, even when the war was already lost, you know. Von Hagen, hanged. Von Harlem, hanged. Von Hardenberg, a landowner, you know. Von Harnack. Uh, he was hanged. Von Hasen executed. Von Hassel hanged. A Graf von Heldorf, a count. He got hanged. So you see, it's 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 all nobility here, and all generals and colonels. Von Hofhacker, he got hanged. Uh, von von Hüslin, he got hanged. Some more colonels and generals. Von Kleist, Schmenzen, uh, nobility, he got hanged. Von no more von Kleist, Schmenzen, well he survived. Eh? Uh, it's all nobility von Kluger. 
suicide, where they were suicided or forced to kill themselves. You know, here you got a gun, you you can choose. You know. Von Lehndorf Steinort Graf, that means he was a count. He got hanged in 1944. Um, Freiherr von Leonrod, nobility, he got hanged. So, the, you know, the, the nobility, they understood at the end of the war they got betrayed by, uh, by Adolf. And um, there was no emperor and the nobility getting back the old world order. They definitely understood they were not getting back in power. Freiherr, nobility, he got executed, hanged, 1944. So you can see here, it's uh, it's an internal war going on here. Von Matushka hanged 1944. Von Quernheim nobility firing squad 1944. They're all high officers, eh? Von Erzen nobility. They forced him to kill himself 1944. Margarete, oh, here's a, a, a woman, survived. It's nobility, all the von is nobility. Von Plettenberg, a landowner, it says. He got suicided. Here we got the, the, uh, the desert fox. Probably also nobility, you know, that uh, they just took away the von, as I told you, von Rabenau, nobility, hanged in 1945. And uh, von Rönne, Freiherr, Freiherr means nobility, he got hanged. And uh, von Schlabrendorf. So, you see, you know, it's not the ordinary German people who were in power. You know, even the Second World War, the First World War, it's all pharaohs, nobility, you know. And the dumb slaves of the people, they just believed everything, you know. And uh, you know, a Graf, it's a count, he got hanged in 1944. Von der Schulenberg, he got hanged. Graf, another count. Here it says Graf, he also got hanged in 1944. So only the, the nobility, they, uh, they conspired against uh, uh, Hitler at the, end of the, uh, at the end of the war. Von Stauffenberg, there he is, was a German aristocrat and lawyer, well, it, all, it all goes together, you know, lawyer and power. He got hanged in 1944. Actually, his, uh, his, uh, his daughter went to Switzerland, his granddaughter living in, uh, oh, this was another Stauffenberg family, a judge. And here, the, here he is, Klaus von Stauffenberg, account executed 1944. And uh, his granddaughter is living in Zurich. Von Stulp Nagel, also nobility, a general, hanged. Uh, Freiherr von Thun, execute firing squad 1944, that's also nobility. Von Treskov, more nobility, suicide 1944. Von Trottu Solz, nobility, firing squad, Nikolaus von Uxkul Gülenband, hanged, nobility, von Willissen, nobility, oh, he survived, wow. And uh, von Witzleben, field marshal, Nobility hanged in 1944. Von Wartenberg hanged in 1944. Heistermann von Zielberg. It's all nobility, you know. So 
we can definitely see here the uh, internal war uh, between the three uh, parties of the nobility, the royalists, the republicans, the royalists who didn't want to mix all the peoples like and um, the uh, republicans who mix all the peoples and races and religions and the uh, most of the old world order they don't want that and then there was the trojan horse the order of the garter and only at the end of the war the german high nobility here the old world order whom i just all showed to you here who got all executed they understood they got betrayed finally by the order of the garter and uh, how it all worked out and, and they understood that hitler he was uh, one of them of the order of the garter who are actually the republican knights templars a uh, trojan horse here you can see hitler together with the german president from 1925 to 1935 for uh, Paul von Hindenburg, again the von nobility. So he was the president and he actually made Adolf Hitler the chancellor in 1934. And afterwards he died the same year. Von Hindenburg, he died. So here it says Hitler and German president Paul von Hindenburg who was the president of Germany from 1925 to 1934, almost 10 years. And just read his face, you know, there's something going on there, isn't it? Now, eh? look at all the octagons and all the Templars crosses. Uh, he doesn't trust it, the whole thing. He doesn't trust the betrayal of this man. He already knows it, you know. So it's, it's all Pharaoh's nobility and internal wars, people. The whole Second World War, the First World War, um, we're being lied to. Also, Rudolf Hess flying to England and Pharaoh's nobility of the Duke of Hamilton called the Englandflug in German for the flight to England in 1941 shows there was something fishy going on between the Nazis and Europe's nobility. Something very suspicious indeed. Like something internal about which the people should never know. And that's why they kept Hess in prison, locked away for the rest of his life to keep the lid on, to keep the secret hidden away from the people. And in those days, there was not such a thing as Scotland. There were just England and Germany. So for historians taking the actual vocabulary of those days, the Hess event is called after the German Der Englandflug, or the England flight. Here you see a commemoration coin. It says Friedensflug nach England, 1941. The peace flight to England. There's no Scotland. Here in the book by, uh, by Mr. Hamilton uh, himself, or the um, uh, descendant. Geheimflug nach England. So there's no England, there's no Scotland. And also here they call it, I'm not sure if you can read it, I'll show you a better picture afterwards. Der Englandflug. No Scotland. It was just England. England having a war with Germany, that's all. It was in the media, it was, uh, and his, for historians, it's, um, this is how the event is being called, the Englandflug. No other words. Here it says, uh, maybe you can read it better here. Der Englandflug von Rudolf Hess, Stellvertreter des Führers. So, the England flight. 
you know, no Scotland. It says they they call it Friedensbote for peace. Well, forget about that, eh? It's about the internal war uh, within the nobility. That's what it's all about. Here to the left, you can see the Duke of Hamilton. You know where the uh, Rudolf Hess wanted to fly to. A duke, yeah, with all his octagons and Templars crosses. Well, my question to you is, um, is this guy Scottish or is he of Pharaoh's nobility? And again, in those days, there was no Scotland. It was just England. You know, it was the big empire, the England, the, you know, only. And here you can see him with his castle. I'm not sure if it's the same duke, by the way. Maybe it's another descendant. This was the Rudolf Hess duke. Here is the, another Duke of Hamilton, or maybe it's the same one. And here you can see his castle, which is in a place, you know, being called Scotland. But this has nothing to do with the Scots. This is Pharaoh's nobility, and it all belonged to England. So here it says Hitler and King Edward. So here you see Hitler shaking the hands of Wallace Simpson, the wife of King Edward VIII, whom you can see here. And look how they are smiling, having a nice time together. Eh? And you all believe the story of King Edward VIII being abdicated just before World War II because of Wallace, Wallace Simpson. And why the Nazis never bombed Windsor Castle, but every child's bedroom around it? I tell you, British naval intelligence had their noses deep into it and knew exactly what was going on. Here it says King Edward VIII and the Garter. So here it says the Garter with Oniswakimali Pons. This thing they tie around their leg. And here you see two times King Edward VIII in his cloak of the garter. Here you see the symbol of the garter. They got this like blue velvet cloak and a, a red sash. All the colors are here white, red, and blue for Pharaoh's colors. So you keep on believing those fairy tales of kings, princes, princesses, and their castles, huh? They shouldn't have murdered my grandfather. And here it says Agent Hitler. Here is the Order of the Garter, Oniswakimali Pons, with a sort of a uh, Templar's cross. And this man here betrayed about everyone in Germany. He betrayed the German people and he betrayed the German nobility. So here it says 1940 Dunkirk, 350,000 soldiers trapped. Here you see them, you know, like a sitting duck, you know. This was not a mistake, you know, this was on purpose, you know. So Hitler sparing the English army in Dunkirk in 1940, where, in fact, Nazi Germany could have decided the war by killing 350,000 British, French, and Belgian soldiers. Because Hitler was a spy and agent of the Order of the Garter who were in the hands of the octagon of the Knights Templars in the motherland of evil, in the Alps, who had financed Hitler from the beginning onwards in Zurich, 1923. So here it says, Agent of the Garter. Here's the agent. Here's the Order of the Garter with the octagons, and here only Swakimali Pals. And here's the big loser, the Emperor of Germany, and the Old World Order, uh, William Wilhelm II. 
So from the very beginning onwards, in 1348, the Order of the Garter has always been an organization by the Knights Templars to lure their brothers of the aristocracy into this Trojan horse trap, which was never so much executed as by the traitor Adolf Hitler during World War II by making a false alliance with the old world order German nobility, but in reality betraying them by his real friends of the New World Order Templars of the Alps. Therefore, yes, we might assume that Hitler was a British spy through the Order of the Garter, thus also betraying, in fact, the British, as the Order of the Garter has always been a spy organization of the Swamplers in the motherland in the Alps. Hitler betrayed everyone, and most of all, the German people, who still don't understand what really happened, and still get the blame for everything, for something our masters and the beast of the Alps in fact bear all responsibility. So here it says, feudal slaves of Pharaoh's nobility, waving with their flags of indoctrination. These feudal slaves who still don't understand what's going on. My grandfather and officer in British naval intelligence, apparently knew that Hitler worked through the order of the Garter just before my grandfather got killed in 1942. And he also knew that de Gaulle was a traitor. And there are more things that run in my family about which I'd like to tell you. In this respect, next time, I will show you some secret documents written by the German emperor about Hitler that have never been published before and what will emphasize furthermore what I'm revealing you here. Thing is that the documents are mostly in German. And though I speak, read, and write German fluently, it all takes time and energy. So I decided to publish and translate the documents in a separate video afterwards. In connection to all of this, I would strongly advise you to watch this video here I made a couple of years ago again on the same channel, Gyuri, and here is the title. So you just scroll down in the video section. And so, so I don't have to do all this again. Uh, so I made it three years ago. In October the 4th, 2020. So it's a lot of work. You know, so I'm not going to do this again. So I'd urge you to watch this video. You know, there are no castles in Europe built before the year 1000. As Europeans never built in stone, just building tribal huts out of dirt, shit, and straw like in Africa. The first stone buildings in Europe were the castles built by Pharaoh's nobility, as they were used to 
at River Nile. Today, there are still 35,000 castles in France, all built around the year 1000, with maybe one or two exceptions. So there must have been a pharaonic invasion around the year 1000, where Pharaoh's nobility took the Europeans as slaves in a feudal system for the next thousand years until today, including the modern world. So the European tribes, they were taken into slavery, just as happened with the American Indians. And until then, the Europeans, they were living as nomads in dirt huts and tents, and just without anything. Same thing, Re history always repeating itself. We're all tribesmen, all the peoples and all races of the world. We've got only the tribes and Pharaoh. And their main base has always been and will forever be Switzerland in the Alps, the base of Pharaoh's nobility out of where they rule the entire world and all nations. So this is a book called The Raven of Zurich. Here he is. His name was Felix Zomari. And it says here, a preface by Otto von Habsburg, the high nobility. And here you see the raven with the full moon and a uh, skull of death and all these um, all these magical books and uh, incantations, probably. And in this video, I would like to tell you about a very dangerous Swiss banker called the Raven of Zurich. And his name was Felix. Zomari, which sort of phonetically associates with Sumeria. Zomari, Sumeria. So here you see his name, Felix Zomari, and here is Sumeria. So in Sumeria, the name is very pharaonic, because in the Demotic pharaonic language, me, it means pyramid, Ri is the sun, and A, it means big or pregnant. So it means we might be, um, and so I, I could translate for you, but I don't have my books here. And here you've got the same, me, ri, zo mari, zo meria. And um, so here it says, born out of the sun, you know, using the pyramid. And here you see these guys with the wristwatch watches here as well, which is very old. And he is having this little handbag. And uh, remember the video I made in Strasbourg, um, you know, the spy of Napoleon, um, also with the little handbag. And that's only like 200 years ago. And there's still people who know about this and what it means, you know. And uh, the video, you can find it in this same uh, channel here. So just look at the, uh, the thumbnails of the, uh, in all the videos to scroll down. So there's definitely a phonetic um, association in the name with Sumeria. Now, why was he nicknamed the Raven of Zurich? And who called him that? Well, the people had no idea who he was and still don't know. So it must be his own community. And he must have been proud of the nickname for using it as the title of his book. Now, what is a raven in the mythical and metaphysical sense of the word? In most ancient cultures, the raven 
is related to death, a bringer of ill omen and a trickster, which seems to fit exactly with what the Raven of Zurich was doing in two world wars of death, destruction, and shady money transactions of Pharaoh's elite in Zurich, the financial capital of Europe, and probably even of the entire world. The Raven of Zurich, the bringer of death, of which I will tell you more in this video. The Swiss Raven was married with the Countess May Domblin de Ville, which you can read here. So here it says, uh, uh, May Zomari, verheiratet, it means married. So she was married to uh, Felix Zomari. Her name was also sometimes Maria Zomari. Domblin de Ville, Maria Gräfin, it means a countess. Oh, here's some more. And here it says, uh, weibliche Bankangestellte, I mean working at a bank. Yeah, Domblin de Ville, Maria Gräfin von. And I don't know what it says more. Mm. Yeah. Okay. So this is uh, Mrs. Raven, if you like. Eh? And of course, as always, the nobility. The Countess married the Raven on April the 2nd, 1930. What you can read here in the book. Now, why is the date of his marriage of this Swiss bankster so important? Because one and a half month later, the BIS and Bank of International Settlements was founded on May 17th of the same year of 1930, about which I'll tell you more a bit later on here in the video. So here you see on page 160 about the Raven of Zurich, we were married on April the 2nd, 1930 in Salzburg. And I'll tell you some more about it. So here he talks a little bit more about his future wife on chapter 35, uh, marriage. In the spring of 1929, Countess May, May Domblin de Ville joined our bank as an executive assistant. The position had been advertised internationally. Hers was an old noble family from Lorraine in France, northern France, tracing its origins back to 1370. That's very old, you know. And remember that the Knights Templars, they were burned in 1314, just before. So the origins go back to 1370. Uh, which had emigrated in 1791, first to Russia and then to Austria. So this is a very old um, aristocratic, pharaonic family. And you have to know the nobility does not marry outside of the nobility. So Mr. Sumeria, he was also part of Pharaoh's nobility, which is already in his name, you know, with all the demotic uh, words in his name. So here you can see these poor people and it says the whole catch. It's the censorship vocabulary because if I use the other name my video gets censored. You see here this entrance and the uh, the garments. So it's probably the descendants of the Raven family of the aristocratic Domblin de Ville bloodline of the Countess, who made some real nasty jokes a couple of year back, couple of years back, about the whole catch on Swiss national TV, which you can see for yourself in this YouTube video 
by Deville on their Swiss State TV YouTube channel. Well, Deville, if you shove the intonation more up front, you get the word devil, right? How appropriate for the Swiss beast in the Alps, the raven of Zurich, and the Swiss nobility de Ville or devil, with their anti jaywalker shows on Swiss state television SRF. Well, it should be clear by now that Pharaoh's nobility are not very fond of the jaywalkers. So here you can see it. They never. So here's that building again uh, from the whole catch, which I just showed you before. And here you can see they never returned the, the gold, you know, so strange. So we melted it. Well, it's funny, isn't it? And here it says Os SRF comedy. It means Schweizer Radio Fernsehen. Swiss radio and TV comedy. This is the official Swiss uh, state TV. And they have this program about Deville, just like the aristocratic family who married uh, into the uh, Felix uh, Zomari uh, dynasty. A very important bankster. So here's the title. And here's the channel name, so you can look it up yourself. And here it is. It was six years ago. Uh, really disgusting, the, the type of jokes the Swissies make about this terrible event in history. I really don't appreciate the jokes the Swissies are making. The Swissies are making about this. The Raven family lived in the Sonnenbergstrasse in Zurich, Switzerland, in an area for the elite called Sonnenberg, meaning Mountain of the Sun, which undoubtedly full of pharaonic descendants in Pharaoh's main base in the Alps, who finally called it Mountain of the Sun, as a direct reference to the sun god Amun-Ra of the great Ennead of Egypt. The Sun Mountain in Zurich is part of the bigger area called Zurich Mountain, or Zurichberg in German, with a lot of forest. So here, together with the Swiss flag, you see Amun-Ra, and there's a lot of sun in the Alps. Here it says on page 143 that in 1922 the raven of Zurich he bought a small house on the Zurich back, Zurich back on the Zurich mountain. And here it says after, on page 160 after the wedding or to the countess we traveled to Sorrento and spent a long time in Italy to the astonishment and occasional indignation of the banking community who felt this prolonged prolonged wedding trip of a colleague at such a time almost as a provocation. Back in Zurich, I divided my time between the bank and my house where many interesting people came to visit us. There on the Sonnenberg, that means the Sun Mountain, one could express opinions openly that were considered taboo elsewhere. People of the most, you know, etc. So, the Sonnenberg, yeah, that's why he was living, which is a part of the Zurich back, the Sun Mountain and the Zurich Mountain, the elite part. We're still at page 160. The Raven says, Back in Zurich, I divided my time between the bank and my house where many interesting people came to visit us. And there on the Sonnenberg, the, uh, the Sun Mountain, 
one could express opinions openly that were considered taboo elsewhere. Now, why did he say that? He apparently he felt entirely safe in Switzerland. You know, it's the base, it's their base, you know. He was amongst the other conspirators, you know. Uh, because they're the laws of silence in the base of the Knights Templars, you know. So that's why he could say this, you know. There on the Sun Mountain, one could express opinions openly that were considered taboo elsewhere. I mean, Switzerland is completely tight. It's airtight. You know, it's the total omerta, which comes out of the Knights Templars anyway. And nothing will ever spill out until Homie Ross came around, uh, around the corner. Until Homie Ross came along. Eh? And that's why they destroyed Homie Ross and his family. So here you can see, here it says Zurichberg. This is the Zurich mountain. And the Sonnenbergstrasse is a bit down. The, um, the Sun Mountain Street where he was living. So this is Zurich. Here's the lake, probably the Zurich Lake. I don't know. And uh, so later on in this, uh, what I'm explaining, this becomes very important. And so you remember this, and I'll I'll show I show it to you like uh, later on. So here's the Zurich Berg, the Zurich Mountain, and here the the Sun Mountain is like here. So here he was living, Sonnenbergstrasse, the Sun Mountain Street, and the Zurich Berg was here. And later on, I'll show you some more. Oh yeah, here it says Zurich Berg, the Zurich Mountain. And go back to the other. Here, Sonnenbergstrasse. And it becomes very important in this um, explanation. The Raven of Zurich was a highly influential Swiss banker during the two world wars. It is therefore no coincidence that the Raven of Zurich lived practically down the road of Villa Schönberg, where Hitler got invited on August the 3rd 1923 in Zurich, Switzerland, which 100 year Jubilee Centennial got celebrated by the Swiss media a couple of months back on August the 3rd, 2023, when it was exactly 100 years ago that Hitler got invited to Switzerland and financed by the Swiss nobility of the Swiss general Ulrich Wille Jr., whose mother, Clara, Countess of Bismarck, was of the house of von Bismarck. So here is the Villa Schönberg. Berg means mountain, and Schön means beautiful. It means the beautiful mountain. Well, this is supposed to be the beautiful mountain. And it was on August 30th, 1923, when Adolf Hitler, he was here and he held a speech. And I have no doubt, as the raven of Zurich, the big financer, he was just living down the road that he was here as well. And also, Richard Wagner, a big anti jaywalker. He also lived here in the 19th century. And Rudolf Hess, he was here at the same time, at uh, August 30th, 1923. And Countess Clara von Bismarck was the mother of Swiss General Ulrich Wille, Jr., in fact. And she was married to also called Swiss General Ulrich Wille, Sr., that was the father. And again, I'll show it to you on the map, the Raven of Zurich. At the same time, he was living right around the corner. And I know that he was definitely here, together with many, many others. This is where it happened. 
the beginning of World War II and all the ugly things happening. So here it says, Villa Schoenberg, where they were all at, at uh, August 30th, uh, 1923. And here once more, Villa Schoenberg. The raven, he was living here. Well, I show it to you now. Here, yeah, Zurichberg, the Zurich mountain. And he was actually living here in the Sonnenbergstraße. And Hitler, he came here, and uh, Richard Wagner, Rudolf Hess, they were all here. This is just down the road, you know. And now, the Swiss general and his mother, the um, Clara Countess von Bismarck, they were living here which is just a couple of kilometers here. And here's a, a big Swiss um, uh, neo-Nazi living here. Uh, he's also in parliament. He was the head of the Swiss SVP party, uh, Christoph Blocher. You know, they're all here. You know, they're all together here. So again, here was the Hitler house, the raven here. And this is just a couple of kilometers down the road. So this was the guy, the general Uli, Ulrich Wille and his mother von Bismarck who invited Hitler here. And with the raven just living down the, court, down the road here. And this is the, it says here in French, Ecole Polytechnique Fédérale de Zurich, that's the ETH, the technical school where Rudolf Hess, he was uh, attending which is just right to next to where the raven was living, like here, somewhere. And here was the Hitler house, Villa Schoenberg. So they all knew each other. And they were all in the, the Villa Schoenberg here, Villa Schoenberg, like a little castle here in Zurich, where they all met up. Here you can see how the Swiss media, they were, they were practically celebrating the uh, centennial. Here it says, heute vor 100 Jahren, 100 years ago, on August 30th, 1923, Adolf Hitler in the Villa Schoenberg. And that was August the 30th, 2023. That's here, SRF. They, they are the same ones who made the, uh, the joke about the, um, about the whole catch. You know, really disgusting jokes, you know, about something you shouldn't joke about, to my opinion. And here as well, on, on TV, it was everywhere. And people were celebrating it in Switzerland. You know, here in the, in the newspaper, this one, and uh, here, fundraising tour for the dictator Adolf Hitler in Switzerland, you know. And this article here, very interesting, with the picture of Adolf Hitler in Zurich. And here it also says here, and it was all over the media, with lots of Swissies celebrating the uh, the hundred year centennial, the jubilee of Adolf Hitler being financed in Zurich in Switzerland by the uh, by the Swiss elite and this. And the Swiss nobility, they were all behind it. So here you can see about the Villa Schoenberg in Zurich, in Zurich. Here you can see it from the other side. The picture before was from this side, where it's going down. You know, it's like on the mountain. Here you see the Swiss cross, of course, with a square in it, you know, for the concept, double the concept of four. There's probably much, much more to see even. So it is a white cross on a red underground, you know. They, they, they put it practically everywhere, you know. And here it says, the officer Ulrich Wille Jr. In 1923, he invited Adolf Hitler in the Villa Schoenberg. You know, I, of course, I can only find it in German. So you're lucky that... Um, 
that I speak German for you. And here, also uh, Richard Wagner. And here it says, Wagner, he lived from 1857 until 1858, uh, like uh, a little bit more than one year, where he made Tristan and Isolde. Uh, he also lived in this thing. And he was also a, a very big anti-Jaywalker. And of course, there were many, many, many others uh, living in this place. They all, they all came together there, you know. So this is about Ulrich Wille Jr. That was the general who invited uh, Adolf Hitler to this house here. It says he uh, invited Adolf Hitler and also Rudolf Hess in August 1923 here in the Villa Schönberg in Zurich. And also, and they were actually living there. The, here it says the, um, um, the the man and wife villa. They were living in the Villa Schönberg, but they had many houses, also in Meilen, which I show you now. And here it says in also they also had the the Villa Wesendonk. Oh, look, another castle. Also in also in Zurich, in nineteen twelve. The German Emperor William II, Wilhelm II, he was even there. All these war makers, you know, they all came there in Swaziland, okay? And the Raven of Zurich, the guy, the, 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 the huge financer of it all, he was just living down the corner. And you're not going to tell me that he wasn't there. And nobody talks about it. So this is the father, Ulrich Wille, of the Swiss general Ulrich Wille Jr., who invited uh, Adolf Hitler in that house where they all, um, Villa Schönberg, where they all came. And here, you know, it's all nobility, von Berneck. Uh, all, the old friends, well, I'll let you read it yourself. And um, yeah, the personal life. Um, they settled in Meilen, which I just shown to you. It's also in Zurich here, in the canton of Zurich, which is also just down the road from the rest here. And he married, uh, Villa was married to Countess Constanza Maria Amalia Clara von Bismarck, the daughter of Count Friedrich Wilhelm von Bismarck. Yeah, there you go. And here, Otto von Bismarck. Well, they're all there, you know. And um, it's all the same clan. And this, this is, you know, this is where they organized and financed uh, World War II, you know. And it says also somewhere he was a um, he was a friend of the German emperor. I don't know where it said. So um, um, the emperor Wilhelm. The second, so you know, it was all about getting him back. You know, the second world war, getting the emperor back on the throne. You know, I hear. As a German of Germanophile and a Teutonophile, we have you ever heard that word? Close to Kaiser Wilhelm the second. There you go. You know, he was a very close friend, and. Um, Well, he needed to get back on the throne, so that's why they financed him in Zurich, Switzerland, in the... So you must always look at the map, you know, if you... And see where they live, you know, just as I did... Um, um, yeah, I always do this, you know, always look at the map where they're situated, you know. Uh, just like the uh, the British um, cyber squadron were, who are you know, just five clicks down the road from Bitchud, you know, very important, look at the map. They were all living together. Rudolf Hess, Ulrich Wille, and inviting Adolf Hitler, the Raven was there, Richard Wagner, the German Emperor Wil Wilhelm II, the uh, von Bismarck, they all concentrated in Zurich in the same, even in the same area in Zurich.
So the mother of the Swiss general Ulrich Wille was Clara von Bismarck. And the House of Bismarck is a very powerful German aristocratic family with the Isis horns in the coat of arms and the concept of three. So here you can see that the Isis horns, the one crown, another crown. Here's a knight. Here's the concept of three. And here as well, which I told you is them. A lot of blue for the war crown. There you can see it. The Isis horns, very important. Uh, normally the Isis horns, you know, she's got the sun in the middle. Well, these ones, they got a, a crown, a double crown. And, um, and Germany's first chancellor was Otto von Bismarck. There was Georg von Bismarck, a German general under Hitler. And they're still in German politics, like the Prince of Bismarck after the war. Also, the Bismarck descendant, the Swiss general Ulrich Wille Jr., lived in Meilen and in the Villa Schönberg, practically down the road from the Raven Banker, who himself, of course, he was married with the Countess. The Countess uh, de Ville, or Devil. Uh, you can read it yourself. It's an extremely powerful family. And they're very much in Switzerland and financing the, you know, fi financing the, the Nazis and the Hamas and, you know. So, as I just told you, also the top Nazi, Rudolf Hess, was living in Zurich where he was studying at the ETH Federal Institute of Technology, also down the road from the Raven, Felix Summary, the most powerful banker in the world of its time. Rudolf Hess was a friend of Swiss General Ulrich Wille Jr. Therefore, Hess invited Hitler to come to Switzerland, where he got financed by the Swiss General and by the wealthy Swiss behind the screens, just as Swissy financed Hamas, they always do this. Now, my assumption is that Hitler also met the Raven, which can't be otherwise, as they were all of Pharaoh's nobility, they all lived in Zurich, practically next door from each other, it was about substantial financing and politics, and the Raven knew the German Emperor Wilhelm II, who wanted to get back on the throne. I'm 100% sure that the Raven was the keystone figure in financing of Adolf Hitler and organizing World War II. And guess who was also at the Federal Institute of Technology of Switzerland, together with Rudolf Hess in Zurich. Well, the Nazi war criminal Werner von Braun, also of the German nobility. So here's his V2 rocket. Here it says it's nobility title Freiherr von Braun it means the free the free gentleman like the Herrenrasse you know the master race as the Nazi said they said the Herrenrasse the, which is the master race or well, he got one of the Herrenrasse Freiherrenrasse you know and uh, here's his signature here he is in his Nazi uniform this is the SS the uh, um, Totenkopfverbände here, and here is a signature, Werner von Braun, and it's him, you can see that, you know, and here it says the ETH Zurich Switzerland, the Federal High, um, Institute of uh, Technology, so he learned all about rockets, he learned it in Switzerland, he learned the things he did later on in his life, he learned it in Switzerland. And Freiherr von Braun bombed England 
with his V2 rockets and used many Auschwitz concentration camp inmates at Auschwitz III, Buna Monowitz, of whom many died of exhaustion. For this killer, Freiherr Werner von Braun of Pharaoh's nobility. So here again his uh, signature, Werner von Braun, here the swastika, here the Templar cross, here the eagle, or probably a falcon. Here it says ETH, the uh, Federal Technical School of Zurich. And here it says Zurich, Arbeit macht frei. And uh, here it says the Swiss connection. The Swiss connection is all over. They finance Hitler. Here's another Swiss connection of the um, rocket construction of Buno, uh, Buna uh, Monowitz in Auschwitz III. So, I mean, these people getting murdered here and the Arbeit macht frei, it's all connected to the ETH of Zurich and the entire Swiss connection. They were all together in Zurich and they all knew each other as they were all of the aristocracy and attending nobility's circles only. They were all in the Villa Schoenberg. Well, of course, not this one, but there's another Swiss connection. And uh, we all know this guy, Elon Musk, of the, um, the Swiss Haldeman dynasty, as you can see here. His mother was a Haldeman, and he was in the ETH in Zurich. Werner, Freiherr Werner von Braun. So I wrote down here, Switzerland's rocket boys of Pharaoh's nobility. And again, there's a connection between the rocket boys uh, crimes, uh, terrible crimes against humanity, like he wants to connect a human brain to a computer, to the internet. Uh, what about that, eh? Uh, he was using up, not just using, he was using them up, concentration camp inmates. I mean, it's all the nobility. He got the Haldeman the the nobility, he got the Freiherr von Braun nobility. And it's all through Switzerland. Always, always, always. It's always Switzerland because it's, it's their base. So here is the ETH in Zurich where Rudolf Hess, he was, and Freiherr Werner von Braun. It says it's the Federal Institute of Technology of Zurich. I'll let you read it yourself. It's, it's really, it's huge. And remember, the biggest banks are in Switzerland, the UBS. The biggest pharmaceutical company, Roche and Novartis, they're also in Switzerland. So I guess maybe this is also the biggest in the world. Uh, so I'll let you read it yourself. I haven't read it all, you know. It's uh, So here you can see, it's it's huge. Look at it, so many buildings. And, and there are more buildings. It's absolutely huge, you know. In Hunger Bag, another bag, another mountain, right? It's absolutely huge, you know, it's like, so again, there's much more to find, but I'm not going to read it everything, you know, so you do that for me. Right. Now here, this is interesting. There's this thing called Eris. It rings a bell, eh? Well, phonetically, it sounds the same as the Greek god of war and destruction, or the war and courage and destruction called Eris, with an E here, but it sounds exactly the same, and they know it. It's the Swiss Academic Space Flight Initiative. And of course, all the, um, all the technology, you know, they're going to use it again, mankind. You know, like Werner von Braun. I always use it against mankind. So, yeah. N notable alumni and faculty. So there is Albert Einstein. Uh, he lived in Switzerland, you know, he helped making the atomic bomb and all that. And here we got, um, we got uh, Werner von Braun here. Yeah. Big criminals. I don't know what's happening here with the... 
Okay. And here there's uh, here it's about the military academy. The Swiss military academy. Uh, they are training there, you know, like the SS Werner von Braun. They all go there. You know, all the big Nazi criminals, you know. Uh, the, instead of writing down the SS, they write down the military, just military academy. It sounds good. I eh? neutral Switzerland, eh? So uh, you read it yourself. So Freiherr Werner von Braun, and probably a lot of more Nazi war criminals going there. Eh? So here is about Werner von Braun. I'm not going to go very long into it because this movie is, uh, this documentary is actually about the Raven of Zurich. But as he was also in Zurich, it is very important to understand it. So it says here, Werner Magnus Maximilian Freiherr von Braun. And um, so um, it's the... Um, it's the nobility, it, it said here somewhere. Anyway, Freiherr, it means uh, uh, nobility. And um, so here it says here, yeah, early life. His, um, about his, uh, so his father, Magnus Freiherr von Braun, and um, is a descendant Oh, also his mother, his mother, Emmy von Quistorf, you know, with the von, it's all nobility. And her ancestry goes all the way back to a uh, descendant of Philip III of France, of Valdemar I of Denmark, of Robert III of Scotland, Edward III of England. Now you got the Order of the Garter again. And Sigmund von Braun here. After the war, he, uh, he, he was also a rocket scientist. Well, look at that, you know. So from his mother's side and father's side, it's, uh, it's all high nobility. And, uh, yeah, again, pharaohs. Eh? So um, I'll let you read it here yourself. So Nazi membership, he was in the SS, I uh, just showed you in a SS uniform. And um, uh, here, oh, here it says, membership in the Allgemeine SS, well, not so much Allgemein. Allgemein, it means the general SS, oh, you know, work on the Nazi regime. Uh, I'll let you read it yourself. I didn't read it all, eh? or actually nothing. And here it says about the slave labor, how we used up, you know, concentration camp inmates who, who died, you know. So here you got arrested, but he never did, uh, he never went to prison. The, the Yanks, they pulled him out. The U.S. Army career, I even was in the U.S. Army. Well, what about that? Eh? Look, there's this, his idea of the, um, the, the U.S. Army. Well, we all know about the paperclip thing, you know. Religious conversion, of course, yeah. Yeah, 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 of course. What is that? Frederick the First, Odvai the the Third. Hmm. And a NASA, a Nazi career. Yeah. A career at the NASA. Oh, engineering philosophy. Oh, he was really a philosopher, eh? Whom did he marry? Maria von Braun. That's probably also of the... Um, ah, he married um, his first cousin, von Quistop, of course. As I told you, nobility only marries nobility. Well, it goes a lot longer, the website here, but you look it up yourself. The um, I'm showing it because he was in Zurich together with the Raven of Zurich, and they knew each other, absolutely. And guess who had lived in the Villa Schönberg in Zurich, where Hitler held a speech on August the 3rd, 1923? Well, 
Hitler's favorite composer, Richard Wagner, also used to live there. Another one of the gang, and all converging into Switzerland. Richard Wagner was a fanatic MCJ walker, just as Mr. Hitler himself and the rest of the gang. So here you see Richard Wagner, and here Mr. Hitler. And here it says Villa Schönberg in Zurich, Switzerland. So it's always Switzerland, and they were both very great anti-jaywalkers. I mean, would it be too hard to ask, you know, or to, to ask you to understand that this anti-jaywalker stuff, that it comes out of Switzerland and the Knights Templars, if all these guys, they all con connected to Switzerland, and they all have the same sort of ideas. So Richard Wagner, he was the, um, the favorite composer of uh, Mr. Hitler. And the whole thing, I tell you, it had nothing to do with German nationalism or... This is just a thing, you know, to um, to unite the German people to make them uh, go to war for the for them, you know, for the uh, for the uh, for the whole nobility, yeah. And it's always Switzerland. It's all getting together in Switzerland, and the whole idea uh, comes out of Switzerland. Richard Wagner was a personal friend of the Swiss Johanna Spiri, who wrote the Swiss Heidi books, which I explain in this video here, that were abundantly used in the Swiss propaganda to fool us all about a so-called clean, neutral and innocent Switzerland, whereas in fact they all were and still are a bunch of racists, Nazis, and war financers. So this video about Heidi and also uh, Richard Wagner, I already told you all about it, so I don't have to do that again. And here's the title, Helvetic Horror Heidi, on my other channel, Homeland Security. It will never pop out because uh, I'm completely shadow banned and censored. So the best thing is go into the channel, go into the video section and uh, scroll it down. Uh, and here I explain about how the, uh, the author about, of the Heidi books, Johanna Spiri, she was a personal friend of uh, uh, Richard Wagner. And now we have the Wagner Group, you know, in Russia. And I have no doubt that she also went to the uh, Villa Schönberg, the uh, Johanna Spiri. So Richard Wagner, he lived in many places, but finally he settled down in this place here, Bayreuth. So here is the uh, raven of Zurich. He's going there. During, it's, it can be seen on page 171. During our stay, we were sought out by the well-known operatic boss, Emmanuel Liszt, who asked us to take him to Bayreuth in our car. He was to sing there. But despite the short distance from Marienbad, in the, so this is in Germany, eh? there was no easy train connections and no international taxi service yet existed. We ordered tickets for Die Meister Singer and Parzival. Dropped list off in Bayreuth and took rooms in Nuremberg. When we wanted to visit Dürer's house the next morning, we found the streets blocked. The Führer was expected in town. An officer saw the Swiss license plates and let our car through. I said to my wife, it's exactly like the East here. The natives have no rights and distinguished foreigners are allowed everything. That afternoon, we arrived at the Feschpiel House in Bayreuth and were kept, etc. So the Feschpiel House in Bayreuth, that's where Hitler went, and also on this occasion. So Hitler met the Raven, of course, I mean, and uh, who already they knew each other from the, uh, the Villa Schönberg in, um, in Zurich. 
And they were there again at the same time, and of course they met. And this is where Hitler always went. So this one here, the Festspielhaus in Bayreuth, which are the, um, they also call it the, um, well, the Festspielhaus. That's where Hitler always went to, uh, to listen to the uh, Wagner music and where all the Nazis went to. And, and it's still, all the neo-Nazis of the whole world, they still come there. Every year, there still are the Festspiele of Bayreuth. You can look it up in the internet. You know. And the raven, he went there. The Swiss raven was born in Austria, like Adolf Hitler. And therefore, we find a preface of the last crown prince of the huge Austro-Hungarian Empire. Otto von Habsburg, in the Memoirs of the Raven. Of course, the Crown Prince of Habsburg also wanted to get back on the throne of Austria, just like the German Emperor Wilhelm II, although he pretended to be against the Nazis. But I have no doubt that in reality Otto von Habsburg made that alliance with the Nazis in order to get back on the throne of Austria and therefore needed the biggest financial grey eminence of his time, the Swiss Raven. So here it says the preface of Otto von Habsburg on the book of Felix Zomari, the Raven of Zurich. So here is a website about Otto von Habsburg. And the Habsburg dynasty, they ruled over a, a huge empire, the Austro-Hungarian uh, uh, Empire. And he said he says he was the last crown prince of Austria-Hungary, a huge empire. You know, you see, you see, the, there are two empires here. There's the uh, Croatian red and white checkerboard, which is the official pharaonic, the red house and the white house checkerboard. And he was a member of the Order of the Golden Fleece. Uh, I mean, ab about this guy, you know, I. I I could do three videos, but okay, the video is not about this, it's about the Raven, so I'll, you have to excuse me, I'll keep it short, you know. He was the uh, eldest son of Charles I and, uh, and the fourth Emperor of Austria. His wife, Zita of Bourbon Parma, it's all the European high nobility. He was born as, uh, Otto was born as Franz Josef Otto Robert Maria Anton Karl Max, not Marx, Heinrich Sixtus Save Felix Renatus Ludwig uh, uh, von Habsburg uh, as the Archduke Otto of Austria. And um, it says he was against Nazism, but don't believe that, you know. Um, no, he also possessed passports of the Order of Malta. Uh, yeah, the Order of Malta, the Hospitallers, you know. Officially, the Sovereign Military Hospitaller Order of Saint John of Jerusalem. That's where they come from. They, the Swiss Cross, the White Cross on a red underground. So his children here, or von Habsburg, von Habsburg. And um, yeah, that uh, he was a, a huge friend, a, a big friend of the Raven. All the friends of the Raven, they're all high nobility. And, and after, the, yeah, it says after World War II, he, he knew Charles de Gaulle, also nobility de Gaulle. 
sovereign order of Malta again, diplomatic passport, he even had a Spanish diplomatic passport, etc. For for these people, there are no borders. You know, there never were any borders. You know, they just do as they please. Well, I'll let you read it yourself. So the um, he did the uh, the preface to the Raven book, and um, only the elite of the world. He knew the entire elite of the world. The Raven of Zurich knew everyone and all the world leaders. The Raven of Zurich was close friends with Baron Jalma von Schacht, Hitler's banker and director of the BIS Bank of International Settlements in Basel, Switzerland, where the theft of the Wall Street crash of 1929 went to in order to finance the German war industry of the Krupp von Bohlen und Halbach dynasty. And you all remember the Halbach girl from the documentary Making a Murderer, right? So here you see Hitler with the Baron Jalma von Schacht. Here it says Baron Jalma von Schacht. Hitler's banker, director of the BIS, Bank of International Settlements, taking orders from the Raven of Zurich, which I'm going to explain you now. I have no doubt whatsoever that the Baron Jalma von Schacht was also in the Villa Schoenberg in Zurich on August the 3rd, 1923, when they financed Adolf Hitler in Zurich. He was there, he knew them all, and he knew, most of all, the Raven of Zurich. So here we can see the Baron Jalma von Schacht. Of course, they don't write it here, you know, that's all being hidden. And here it says he was a, first, a fierce critic of his country's post-World War I reparations obligations, of course, through the, uh, the Bank of International Settlements, which finally the, uh, the American people paid with the, um, the Wall Street crash. He was also central in helping create the group of German industrialists and landowners that pushed Hindenburg to appoint the first NSDAP-led government. So here it reads landowners, so that's who were the landowners, nobility, and they still are, you know, everything belongs to them. They had a castle, they still have, and all the land around it belonged to them. So this is, again, the internal wall between the horizontal and the vertical rule. The landowners are the vertical rule, and the other ones who want to, you know, a horizontal rule, they... Uh, the other ones, you know, the the New World's Order. And um, yeah, I'll show you some more. Uh, here it says, Schacht was tried at Nuremberg, but was fully acquitted despite Soviet objections. He never had any problems. You know. He was born in Prussia um to william leonard ludwig maximilian schacht well that's a, that's a very aristocratic name and his father was married with the baroness constance justin sophie von eggers a native of denmark well the nobility doesn't marry with non-nobility and a lot of them they don't have the the von anymore in their names so he's um his mother a baroness uh, his father with this incredible long name, a Maximilian. They always have Maximilian sort of in their names. It's um, it's all nobility, you know. Of course it is, you know. Uh, by, behind the entire world war and all the wars. Schacht was a Freemason, having joined the Lodge Urania zur Unsterblichkeit in 1908. Unsterblichkeit, that means um, you're never going to die. Urania, um, eternal. You know. During the First World War, Schacht was assigned to the staff of General von Lum, 
the banking commissioner for German occupied Belgium to organize the financing of Germany's purchase purchases in Belgium. Well, we remember who was the um, uh, the um, the director or the leader of the um, German mission over Belgium over the entire First War. Well, that was the Raven of Zurich. That was Felix Sommery. So that means Schacht, he was taking orders of the Raven of Zurich. And he stayed completely behind the screens for his whole life because he was the most important man behind it all, more important than Schacht. I mean, they could sacrifice Schacht in case, you know, but never Felix Sommery, never the Raven of Zurich. So here, you know, if he was a Freemason, as it says here, Schacht was a Freemason. Well, I mean, it's a bit hard to believe that the Nazis, they persecuted the Freemasons, isn't it? Actually, it was 33rd degree. And he was so-called in the resistance after the war. Well, he's in an internment camp. Well, before it says he was acquitted. He was acquitted at Nuremberg, okay. Never had any real problems, though he was really one of the men behind, the, um, behind Hitler and the, and the entire Second World War. You know. He just died in Munich in 1970, you know, a free man. and The Baron, yeah. Well, here is the base, the Bank for International Settlements. The logo here has four parts for the concept of four, uh, which is stands for the square, and the square can also be seen here. And this is a circle, like a bit in the um, in a, th a third dimension, like a bit uh, like um, moved a bit, like an, um, under another angle. But it's so it's supposed to be a circle. So in a circle, the compass you can make a circle with it. So it says square and compass in the colors of the Knights Templars, red and white. And the squares here definitely says square and compass. And this is like the um, of the focus, you know, the uh, the crosshairs. You know, and the square is us, so they're, they're focusing on us, you know. The square, that's the base of the pyramid, that's us, you know, the uh, the slaves, yeah. Of course, we can say a lot about this, but I'll keep it short, try it. It's very difficult for me. So they talk about Schacht here. And I thought he was the first director. Uh, I think they changed it here in the Wikipedia. And the central bankers, Montague Norman, well, the Raven also knew Montague Morgan, uh, the central banker of uh, for the um, for England. There was no UK at the moment. It was England. And Jalma Schacht for Germany. There's Jalma Schacht. Here's Montague Norman. They all knew each other. And they both knew the Raven of Zurich even being good friends. And uh, I, that's the number two building of the uh, the base. It's also in Basel. It's just a couple of hundred meters down the road. Uh, I went filming there once. And um, you shouldn't stand there too long because you get arrested by the police immediately. Well, what, what happened to people, you know. So, and this here is uh, the website on Felix Sommery, the Raven of Zurich. So, he was born 1881 in Vienna, where Hitler also was, you know, at the same time. And um, he died, of course, in Zurich in 1956. And he was an Austrian-Swiss banker. And here it says, uh, during World War I, he recognized the, um, the National Bank of Occupied Belgium, and he worked together with Jalma Schacht, of whom he speaks favorably in his memoirs. So here you can read some more about him. I'm not going too uh, deep into it here. Uh, so I'll let, you, I'll let you read it yourself. 
So here are the, um, probably the memoirs here, the Raven of Zurich. No, I don't see it, never mind. So this is the Raven of Zurich and he knew them all. And born in Austria, just like Adolf Hitler and he became Swiss. So for the Swiss, you know, it was no problem. You know, these people, they just make, give him a Swiss passport. Okay, no problem. For Sean Ross, you know, never. He's been terrorized for 26 years and it goes on. Well, this is the difference, you know. So in the book, The Raven of Zurich, his memoirs on page 157 here, the, it's the chapter, The World Depression, from 1929, yeah, the Wall Street crash, in 1932, and the biz got founded in 1930. So, and he's talking about it, during the time they stole the American savings of um, normal American citizens, the Wall Street crash. Um, he was meeting Schacht all the time. So now I'm going down page, and I'll show it to you how he was meeting with... Uh, the Baron Schacht, Jalmar Schacht. So here it is. I stopped between trains at Baden-Baden at Schacht's invitation. He was engaged with the rep representative of the First National Bank of New York and First National Bank of Chicago in drafting the bylaws of the Bank of International Settlements in Basel. Here they stealing the, uh, the Wall Street crash, yeah? which was to try to balance international payments in connection with the reparations agreements. When I was asked what I thought about all that, I answered with the uh, pun, Ave Cesar Moratoria to Salutant. Yeah, yeah. At dinner with Reynolds and Taylor, I said that I would witness in the course of my forthcoming New York visit the beginning of the greatest crisis of our generation. Schacht hoped that the coming chaos would bring an end to the reparation pay payments. Well, who was paying the reparation payments was Germany. And he would hope that would end. Yeah, it ended because the Americans paid it with the, uh, the money of the Wall Street crash. They stole it. And uh, the, the Raven of Zurich is all behind it. You know, Going to America, talking with the Federal Reserve and uh, transferring the money. I always sh already showed you this in the um, in my film, The Swiss Beast, Home of the Devil, Part One. So here, right after the Wall Street crash heist, robbing the Americans of their money, uh, right after it, so here it says in 1929, um, the Raven of Zurich is uh, talking about the. Um, about the Federal Reserve. So here, on my arrival, so that's the Raven talking here in New York, I called on, in 1929, eh? I called on a private banking firm friendly to Blanc Art and Company. And they are one of the senior partners who had been attorney, attorney to old John D. Rockefeller, was just about to go on a, on a meeting at the House of Morgan to discuss market support operations. When I asked what had been discussed with the Treasury and the Federal Reserve Bank officials, he answered with contempt, uh, with contempt about his own. He said, who bothers with that crowd in Washington? And when he came, I mean, a banker is saying, you know, like, who bothers about the politics or the government? We stand above it. That was mean. And when he came back from the meeting, he put in large orders for share purchases for himself and his family. <laughs> Why should anything have changed in one week in this country? He exclaimed with proud superiority, with Swiss superiority, you know, you could say. I cabled my partners, keep clients out, out of the market, crisis just beginning. And in the middle of December 1929, you know, after it happened, I returned to Zurich. There I found an invitation from General von Sicht, the president of the Reich Supreme Court. You know. So this is really behind the screens, you know, how they are robbing the American people of everything, you know. 
And remember, Swissy did it again, you know, like uh, well, they did it with the Jaywalkers and the Nazis. They did it uh, in, in the crisis of uh, 1980, I think it was. The fight, the the, the world financial crisis, and the um, the tax evasion stuff, you know, there was also Morgan here, the House of Morgan, and, and all these same banks and the Federal Reserve. They never stop, and nobody's ever stopping them. Therefore, in order to get the Wall Street crash heist into Switzerland, the Raven of Zurich had to know the actual US president of the time, which he did as the Swiss raven was friends with President Herbert Hoover himself, also of Swiss descent, by the name of Huber. Therefore, Herbert Hoover fed the Austrian population in 1918, after the war, that was the First World War, through US aid. Well, it always looks good to pretend to be philanthropic and hand back a tiny, teeny bit of the huge amount of stolen assets. And anyway, it was the US taxpayer who finally paid the bill. So, I mean, look at them. They have exactly the same nose, same squeezed lips, the same chin with this little thing in there here too, the same ears, and the ears are very important, you know, for to recognize the same ears, same head, the same broad uh, brachycephalic heads, and their real names were Huber. I looked it up, and I put it in my film, The Swiss Beast, Home of the Devil, number one, and they Americanized it into Hoover. So this is Herbert Hoover. He was the the American president at the same at the same time in 1929 of the uh, the Wall Street crash heist, and he was the director of the FBI also at the same time. He was for 50 years, half a century, the director of the FBI, and J. Edgar Hoover, real name Hoover, and. Um, in 1929, he was the director of the FBI. And it said in the book, The Raven of Zurich, that the Raven knew Herbert Hoover. But I wrote it down somewhere and I can't find it anymore. Um, you can buy the book yourself. And yeah, it's the same family. I mean, the enemy within of the, uh, uh, in the United States, um, they are very real. And uh, the U.S. has been taken over since a very long time, you know. And it all comes out of the Knights Templars, who founded Switzerland in 1291. So, at page 158, the Raven even says so in his memoirs, how he went to the Federal Reserve in the U.S. during the Wall Street crash of 19. 29, and discussed the matter with the Fed's officials. Now, what's the Swiss Raven doing in the US talking to the Fed during the Wall Street crash? Huh? Well, you tell me, or should I rather tell you? So here you see the Raven of Zurich, here the uh, mystical Raven or metaphysical Raven as this one, the title is, of course, a reference not to the normal bird, but to the metaphysical uh, message in, um, in the old cultures. And here's the Wall Street crash of 1929. And he was there. Funny thing is that the BIS, the Bank uh, for International Settlements, was founded on May 17, 1930. And just before, one month before, on April the 2nd, 1930, the same year, the Raven married his countess, May Domblain de Ville. 
guess things were doing all right due to the Wall Street crash heist that he needed to celebrate it with a marriage as he knew by then that he made it to the top with his future and his future family secured. I mean, marrying a countess, you have to put something on the table, right? By then, he already had been living in Switzerland for eight years, from 1922 onwards, on the mountain of the sun in Zurich. So here you see the bis with the Swiss flag. I, I, I went here filming once, and it is in Basel, uh, next to Germany and next to France. And it was founded on May 17th, 1930. Here's the Raven of Zurich. It says the Raven, and on April the 2nd, 1930, just before the founding of the biz, where the, the Wall Street crash money went to, the whole heist, um, he married his countess because he knew he made it and he had, um, he had it on the table for his countess. You know, you need something for a countess, right? So on their website here, the biz.org, biz Bank for International Settlements. And here their, their square and compass logo with the Swiss colors and the Knights Templars colors. They even say it was founded on January 20th, 1930. It's very complicated, all this financial stuff. Maybe they make a difference between founding and when they really are using it, you know. So this is even better. And he, you know, he got married uh, on May 17th. No, April 2nd. So uh, the, he was absolutely sure, you know, he, he had everything on the table for his counters. So then here the bank was founded uh, before he got married and he was completely sure and everything was okay and then he got married. And you say, okay, hi, look, darling, I made it, you know. And the founders are Yalma Schacht and Montague Norman and, and the raven knew them all. It's all in the book. The first Baron, Norman. They're all Barons and, and Countesses. And, and listen, I don't see any jaywalkers, you know, in the whole equation. And, and never, ever. It's Pharaoh's nobility all over. You know, look at history. In Switzerland, the Raven also knew the seven heads of the beast like the federal councillor Obrecht, to be seen on page 185. The raven knew them all, all right. So here it says, the federal council, here he is. He came from Grinchen. He was elected 1935, and uh, he stopped 1940. And his successor was Edmund Schultes. Funny, I know the name. Schultes, the uh, daughter or granddaughter of uh, the Count von Stauffenberg, who tried to kill Hitler on July 20th. His daughter or granddaughter, her name is now uh, Schultes and living in Zurich. You can, you can, you can all look it up. So this, here you see the Swiss flag here in a coat of arms here. And uh, this is their original, the Federal Council of the original uh, website. And you all see the uh, the little moustache, eh? That was quite popular in Switzerland, of course, at the time. You know, at the time of the Second World War. The same moustache as, uh, as Mr. Hitler. So here, also on page 183, the chapter Ideological Preparations for the Second World War, 1936-1938. Now, why is he calling it ideological, you know? The ide ide ideological thing here is Switzerland, their base, you know, and he's actually preparing Switzerland for the war because he knows as the raven, you know, Odin's little bird and, um, you know, uh, giving the uh, ill omen and the bringer of death in many cultures, 
Well, it's not the fault of the poor, the poor bird, of course. And um, you know, he's um, he he knows the raven knows what's coming. You know, so here it says, yeah. Uh, however, the older members of the audience seem to be taken aback by the definite forecast of war that I expressed throughout my speech. You know, was probably in the um, in the Villa Schoenberg, yeah, where Hitler was. Such frank talk about international affairs was a rare exception in cautious Switzerland. A few days after, afterward, Federal Councillor Obrecht, Hermann Obrecht whom I had not previously known, the chief of the economic department in Bern, called on me to discuss measures for economic war preparedness. So the raven is preparing Switzerland for the war. Yeah? So uh, we stayed here, and it goes on. Obrecht began with an unusual question. The leaders of the agricultural interests, as well as the social democrats, have spoken of me with great respect. Uh, he's the man behind it all. So they talked about him with great respect and advised him to contact me. My own banking, confrère, that means uh, brothers, like in a brotherhood, confrère. That's why I'm using the, like the French name, because all the initiated know, know now it's, you know, he's talking about a brother, the brotherhood, you know, Freemasons, nobility and all that. Otherwise, he would use, he would use another word, yeah. On the other hand, so my own banking, Freemason uh, and nobility brothers, that's what it means. On the other hand, and the association of bankers had complained of deliberate, well, it's on the next page. And here uh, on page 185, it says, I added, the Raven added, that Switzerland should no longer hesitate to take war preparedness measures. I quickly summarized the basic raw materials needed for war. Well, he knows everything because four years during the entire World War I, he was the head of the Belgian mission, the, the German mission in uh, Belgium. He was ruling the whole country in Belgium, you know. And so he knows it all and thereby laid down certain principles which were adopted by Obrecht, Hermann Obrecht, one of the seven heads of the beast, yeah, and which gave the Swissies war econ economy from that point on its special character, you know, well, and so forth, and so forth. So this guy, not even the, um, the uh, federal councillor Obrecht, he took all the measures, no, the raven of Zurich, and we never heard of this guy, you know, we all talk about Rothschild and, and all the other ones, you never, you know, because they stay behind the screens, you know, and it's all Pharaoh's nobility, you know. So we have to think differently, or, or I do, but I mean, you, you know, it's all here. And unfortunately, I can't show you the whole book, but I just give you a, an idea, you know, who this guy was. And there's no, there's no, Coincidence, he, you know, he was nicknamed the Raven, yeah. The Raven of Zurich also knew the Austrian Emperor Franz Josef, who had his wife murdered in guess where? Yes, Switzerland. And I made this video about it. So this is the Empress Sissi. You know, if you turn around, you get Isis. Elizabeth of Austria slain by an anarchist, the empress stabbed to the heart. And where did it happen? Yeah, Geneva, Switzerland. Because this woman was very, very much against wars. She was an anti-militarist, a pacifist. And I guess that wouldn't be a first world war because Austria was really a mighty, huge empire. Uh, which lasted until um, uh, 1918, after the um, uh, First World War. That was the end of many, many empires. The German Empire, the Austro-Hungarian Empire. So it's on my channel, Gatsefrats here, nine years ago. 
And here is the uh, Swissy Killed Sissy. And here's the title. So you just, um, if you punch it in, you probably won't pop out. So you probably have to scroll down in the uh, in the video section. And uh, she was married with the the last emperor of um, of Austria, uh, Franz Josef, who also wanted, of course, to go to come back and uh, get back on the throne. You know, just as Emperor Wilhelm the second it's it's again the internal war within the aristocracy between the uh, the vertical and the horizontal rule and of course then the uh, uh, the order of the garter oh. and as the raven new german emperor wilhelm the second and some world war 1 german aristocratic generals he became the head of the German mission to Belgium throughout the whole First World War from 1914 to 1918 in order to pillage Belgium for raw materials for the German war industry. So in 1914, the Raven was only 33 years old as he was born in 1881 in Vienna. And one must really be born in some powerful dynasty when practically ruling over Belgium during World War I at the age of 33 only. So here on page 80, um, chapter 17, called The First World War, My German Mission, to Belgium. So this guy is not even German. He's Austrian and Swiss. And um, he's only 33 and practically ruling the whole of Belgium. Uh, how is this possible, you know? On August the 1st, 1914, well, August the 1st is the national holiday of Switzerland. And um, when they were founded in 1291. So, well, I'm not going to show everything here. It's um, best thing is to uh, to read the whole book for yourself, and I'm just giving you an idea. Here on page 91, chapter 18, the meeting of the war economy in the Ministry of the Interior on November 15, 1914. So, the Ministry of the Interior of Germany for an Austrian 33-year-old guy. So I'll read for you. The Ministry of the Interior in Berlin arranged a meeting for November 15, 1914, in which senior civil servants were to establish a program for the direction of the war economy. You know, they're going to pillage Belgium for raw materials. The governor of the military government in Belgium ordered Lum, I think it was a general, and myself to travel to Berlin and attend the meeting to which the heads uh, of the most important military, economic, and treasury departments were summoned by State Secretary Richter. Not much more than three months had gone by since the war began, and the severe shortcomings in German war preparations were already apparent. So they know they, they don't have enough war materials, and that's why he's sent to Belgium to arrange all that, you know. The military had grossly underestimated the need for material, as had been demonstrated even in the earliest battles. So here at the end, end of page 91, the same page as before, the rest is also important, but uh, I just take the most important stuff here out of here. No European great power had stockpiled sufficient raw materials or even marshaled its foreign assets in the last year of peace. Thus, the war economy was not in any sense equal to the new situation. You know, Germany having, is having problems. They don't have all the colonies, and, and like England, you know, being an island, uh, having shipments, so they have to steal it somewhere else, and like in this case in Belgium. And the raven of Zurich went there, you know, to see to that. The invitation to the meeting at the Ministry of the Interior was itself evidence of the serious position 
when the military caste, especially in wartime, calls for help from civilians and even agrees to submit in their authority. The need is most acute. The question for discussion was that of covering our needs for raw materials. Now, going to Belgium here, yeah, the question for discussion was that of covering our needs for raw materials, like pillage Belgium, and how purchases were to be financed in gold assuming the war should continue until the spring of 1915. The estimates presented to the meeting were frightening and the proposals based on them both tentative and ill-conceived. After some two hours of discussion, I asked for the floor. I said we had been discussing how we could manage with our well, etc. etc. So he's at the head of the German mission of Belgium, you know, to pillage Belgium at 33 years old. So this is an extremely extra extraordinary powerful person, the Raven of Zurich in the base of Pharaoh in the Alps. So it was somewhere in the book that the Raven knew the uh, the Emperor of Germany, um, Wilhelm II, and the Emperor of Austria, Franz Josef. But um, I don't know where I wrote it down on what page, you know, my notes as I'm traveling with two backpacks and being a homeless, so I'm sorry for that. So the Raven was also a friend of Count Schwerin von Krosik. I don't know how to pronounce it. He should be supposed to be German, but a real funny name. It sounds like Egyptian. Who later became a German finance minister in 1932. So the Count became a finance minister. So... Here you can, on page 162, uh, chapter 37, the acute phase of the crisis and prediction of a turning point in mid-1932. So I skipped the rest here. And um, yeah, I went in March 1931 to Berlin, where I met the Finance Ministry State Secretary Schaeffer and under State Secretary State Secretary, later Finance Minister, Count Schwerin von Krosik. <laughs> How can you pronounce this? This is not German. It's, it's Egyptian, pharaonic. You know? Who describes in his book, it happened in Germany, my, my visits, or the visits of the Raven, in 1931 and the spring of 1932. And the Count wrote about the Raven in the spring of 1931, the Swiss banker, a summary, uh, like Sumeria, who also had a reputation of an uh, economist, called on me at the fin finance ministry. Well, and it goes on. So, again, I don't see any jaywalkers. It's all counts and barons and kings and emperors, uh, pharaohs, nobility. So, there he is. The, um, and here's his name. Lutz Graf Schwerin von Krosik. So is that, if anybody knows how to pronounce the dude's name, well, tell me, because I don't know. I have no idea. I speak perfect German. I read it. I write it. This is not German, you know. The, 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 the Graf here was a count. And it's, he was a real heavyweight eh, in politics, real heavyweight. Uh, he was a Nazi and... Uh, Account Graf von Schwerin. Schwer, it means a heavyweight. Schwer, it means heavy. So he studied in Lausanne, Switzerland. Yeah, and who studied there as well? Ian Fleming did. And um, the Prince Bernhard of Darkness. You know? They all know each other. Of course they do. They're all counts and kings and, and aristocrats. Yeah. So he was uh, he, he was in the Nazi party. Uh, the president Paul von Hindenburg, you remember the picture of him uh, together with Hitler. He actually made Hitler the chancellor. Asked him to stay in office under Kurt von Schleicher. Well, another nobility, von Schleicher, Franz von Papen. I don't see any jaywalkers, people. It's all nobility. Right? And um, uh, 
um, yeah, he was appointed here the Minister of Finance by Franz von Papen in 1932. Um, and uh, well, even after the after the war, he continued in politics. And uh, as it says he was in the Nazi Party since 1937, so not from the beginning. He was even uh, under Konrad Adenauer. After the war, a real heavyweight in politics, eh? Um, and they, um, the um, uh, the Raven, he knew them all. It's in the book. The Raven of Zurich also was a friend of Baron Louis de Rothschild, Rothschild, the Baron, yeah. Because he knows that he was a baron and that it's important, that that makes the difference between a, a jaywalker and a pharaoh. So the raven also was a friend of Baron Louis de Rothschild of the jaywalker nobility. And he was friends with Montague Norman, the director of the Bank of England. So it says on page 163, in June 1931, I was with my wife, the Countess uh, uh, d'Amblin de, de Ville, in Marienbad, and there received a telephone call from Baron Louis Rothschild, de Rothschild. So he just got a telephone call from the Baron of Rothschild, yeah? saying that the Austrian government was going to ask me to take over the administration of the reorganized Kreditanstalt, that's a bank. Baron de Rothschild begged me to give this proposal serious consideration. So, to take over the administration of a bank. I don't know where the bank is. Uh, I refused absolutely because he had bigger plans, you know, bigger plans, the uh, the raven. But he asked me at least to hear what the government people had to say. Shortly afterwards, the Austrian Minister of Finance rang to say that I had only to name my terms. Oh yes, an Austrian bank, and they would be accepted regardless. And he asked me, so he just got the Minister of Finance calling him up as well probably also an aristocrat, an aristocrat. I could look it up for you, but you look it up for yourself. Of course, they're all nobility. And he asked me not to answer immediately. So that was the Minister of Finance. Since I would also receive a telephone call from England. That evening, I was asked by an official calling on behalf of Montague Norman, the governor of the Bank of England. So here are supposedly, you know, like enemies from world wars and, you know, the, the, the big shots, the hot shots, you know, they're just making telephone calls with each other. And, you know, it's only the people, the slaves are fighting, not these ones. Yeah, they're all friends. They're all nobility. You get it. So the governor of the Bank of England to accept the offer made by Vienna with the assurance that I would receive full support from London. Then I gave my answer with absolute clarity. I predicted the economic. Well, that's important. I'll show that to you. So here it goes on. I predicted. So the Raven is predicting to uh, Montague Norman and also to uh, the Roth Baron de Rothschild. I predicted the economic depressions in Germany, England, and America. Yeah, of course, you know, he, he, you know, he was in it, you know. It's it's not so much predicting, eh? he just, you know. And he predicted the coming of Hitler. Yeah, well, of course, you know, he was there at the Villa Schoenberg, you know, in 1923, of course. He was living around the corner, and he knew, he knew them all. And then later, the Second World War. He's predicting the Second World War. No, he knew the Second World War. You know, that's why this man is so important. So, and that's why he was called the Raven. Of Zurich as a raven, you like Odin's raven. Is a raven is predicting uh, the ill omen in many like uh, superstitions in many cultures. 
Of course, it's not true. It's I mean, it's all it's it's their pharaonic, you know, superstition. Superstition, anyway. I think a raven is a beautiful bird, and you know, for us Europeans, you know, normal white people, you know, it's just a normal. It's a beautiful bird, and and that's it. You know, all these religious hocus pocus is all coming from the Middle East and these pharaohs, you know, and all the superstition, all that, and the black magic. Even if I were prepared to make the great personal sacrifice, uh, it's a personal sacrifice because he had higher plans. I, he didn't want to be the director of just some bank in, in Austria. That would be entailed in taking on the Kreditanstalt in Austria. A man with my views, whoa, he's getting arrogant here, was not appropriate for the, a position at Europe's weakest point. You know, the weakest point is the uh, the empire, the Austro-Hungarian empire that uh, just collapsed and became very tiny. I advised my caller, so that was uh, Montague Norman, to appoint some hack who saw the future in less pessimistic terms than a raven, you know, and then asked him to be kind enough to let me go on with my Marienbad holiday. I was thereupon asked, well, etc., etc., so it's not so much about predicting. This guy knew Hitler was coming, the Second World War was coming, because he was there in Switzerland. He was always there everywhere. He knew all the counts and all the countesses, married with the countess, all the, the, the emperors. Uh, he knew them all, you know, the raven. He's proud of his nickname, the raven. You know, it's, and, and then... He's laughing, you know, he's like in himself, like, you know, he knows it all and the other people are saying, oh, how can he predict it? You know, the raven, how can the raven predict it all with his ill omen? Because he knew, he knew, Mr. Sumeria, he knew. So here is Montague Norman, a baron, the first baron Norman, you know, from the Normans, yeah? The ones ruling uh, over England, you know, the Norman conquest. It's the Baron Norman, probably also speaking French. You know. it's, it's all nobility. And remember the video I made uh, on the um, Elon Musk uh, Holderman dynasty, uh, one of his ancestors of the Holderman dynasty was also the uh, director of the, uh, the Bank of England, also a Holderman. You know. And it says he also joined the uh, fourth Bet Bedfordshire and he uh, Herefordshire militia in 1894 and served in the Second Boer War. Uh, uh, he was awarded the Distinguished uh, Service Order, the DSO, in 1901. Well, what did he do there? They murdered 25,000 uh, Boer children. You know, in my country, that's what they did, and he gets a medal for it. You know, and it was the um, it was the nobility anyway. You know, Churchill was there, Lord Churchill, uh, one of the guys of the Balfour Declaration. He was the uh, the governor of South Africa. Even I don't recall his name. There was Lord Kitchener, the butcher, and he was there as well. He was just calling with the raven and, yeah, let's do this and let's do that. You know, the stupid slaves, you know. they. And here he became a partner in Brown Shipley in 1900 before leaving for South Africa and retired. So they're all in business, politics, nobility, everything at the same time. Just as today, all these politicians, they all like Donald Trump. They're all billionaires. And Trump is also of a, of the, um, um, of the nobility, Swiss from his father's side of the Palatines in Germany, connecting the Rhine, connecting the Palatines with Switzerland, and from his mother's side, the Scottish side, uh, from a line of um, Scandinavian, uh, Norwegian, Danish uh, nobility. You know, he's uh, yeah, he's somewhere a cousin with the, with the Queen of you know these Scandinavian countries, you know. So Norman was a close friend of the German Central Bank President Jalmar Schacht, well, together with the Raven, well, etc. You know, 
Both were members of the Anglo-German Fellowship and the Bank of International Settlements in Basel. Well, there he is again, you know, the beast, yeah? Uh, well, etc., etc. Uh, who did he marry? Uh, he married this one, probably also, uh, yeah, here, Priscilla, Cecilia, Maria, Rhinteens. Rhinteens. A granddaughter of Montague Bertie, the seventh earth, Earl of uh, Abingdon. <laughs> well, okay, well, you know, there's a sort of their castle here, you know, this is where he was living, probably. It's uh, nobility all over, Pharaoh's nobility leading us into world wars, and the third one coming up. The Raven of Zurich was also friends with the Countess, Countess Lanskoronska, whom you can see here in some sort of a uniform. Uh, Polish, it says here Polish, with a sort of a dragon on her shoulder on the patch. So he's, she's got, I'm not going to pronounce this, it's a very long Polish aristocratic uh, name. So it says here the countess, that's what a count looks like, with an octagon, a sash, a pharaonic sash, and the rest, okay. Uh, so she was a Polish noble, yeah. Uh, a resistance fighter, well, forget it. Yeah, she probably sort of was mixed into it, but that's the internal war within the nobility. So the uh, the old world order, the vertical rule, the royalists, they were shoved aside by the new rule, the horizontal rule of the republicans. Uh, they were just fighting to get their castles back, you know, um, and, you know, all these big properties are not really allowed in the horizontal rule. But as we're going back more and more to a feudal system, it's more and more allowed. So the the horizontal rule actually now, it's the last for the last 10 or 20 years, is becoming more and more a vertical rule again. You know, if you've got like leaders like Donald Trump, who is multi-billionaire, you know, having castles himself and coming out of a castle, you know, it's all coming back under the uh, under the veil of the uh, New World Order uh, horizontal rule. Okay, and um, you know, she lived at her family's palace, the the Palace Lankoronsky. Oh, look at that! It's huge, huge. You know, so don't believe she was like a. Um, resistance fighter for the Polish people against the horrible Nazis and all that. No, the Nazis, you know, it's, well, I showed that in my, in my, especially in my last video about the, um, uh, the agent of the, um, of the order of the guard, oh, the agent of the Carter, uh, Adolf Hitler. You know, it is complicated, you know, so there's a lot more to see here. And yes, she went to a concentration camp, but, you know, why? Because of this internal war in the nobility. So that doesn't mean she was at our side. No, not at all. Oh, look, after the war, she left Poland and lived in Fribourg in Switzerland. Well, okay, got it. Yeah, well, she knew, yeah, because she knew the raven, the raven of Zurich. It's in the book, I'll show it to you. Yeah, that's why she went there to Switzerland. Well, why, why would she leave Poland? You know, she was a resistance fighter, so she should have been like honored. Well, she couldn't get because the communists were there, so she couldn't get her castle back, right? Because the communists—that's the, uh, the the new horizontal rule in those part in those parts of the world yeah in our in the uh, in the western parts of the world it's also the horizontal rule but it's more like the capitalist horizontal rule so even within the horizontal rule the new world's order even there there's an internal war you see uh it's it's, it's incredibly complicated so 
So, you know, they also had the royal castle that was theirs. The, it's the Lankoronsky collection and the Wawel castle. Very powerful family, very powerful dynasty. So no wonder the Raven of Zurich, you know, she he very fond to keep her in his collection of friends and other counters, just like his wife. So here, the Raven of Zurich, on page 242, the other lunch guest was Countin, Countess Lanskoronska, the daughter of Count Lanskoronski, the Polish connoisseur, connoisseur uh, from the French word connaître, meaning someone who knows himself, you know, you know, about things, whose house near the Belvedere, that means uh, a good sight, good seeing, Belvedere, Vedere, it means to see, Bel, it means good, in Vienna, whose collections and whose personality were all e equally unforgettable to those who knew him. Terrible things had happened to the daughter during the German occupation of Poland. She told us about it calmly and with a resigned air as if her personal fate was a matter of indifference to her. Well, if you have a noble upbringing, you know, uh, this is the way you are taught to, to behave. You know, it's called the uh, etiquette. You know, it's, uh, keep a distance from everything and everyone. Uh, if one has the misfortune to live in a time of leaders who, exp who pander to the worst instincts in the masses, what else can one expect? Any hint of attempting to arouse sympathy or pity was quite alien to the counters, proud spirit as a pole she belonged to a people who had been used to oppression for 150 years well <laughs> you know it was the nobility oppressing the people so you know this is this is a weird sentence you know of course written by a nobleman and as an aristocrat she was accustomed to standing alone in spite of everything, she preferred to stay where she belonged in Poland, in a world ruled by the worst elements of the people. You know, so the, an aristocrat, the Raven of Zurich, together with his countess uh, friend Lanskoronska, you know, they're talking about the people and, and calling them the worst elements. You know. It's like, you know, being at, the, at, at some royal court, you know, uh, hearing them talk about the slaves of Pharaoh and made no concession to the times, not in the hope for a, a better future, for after all, what difference was there between a proletarian from Upper Austria and one from the Caucasus? Yeah. A proletarian, yeah, well. So the um, the counter, Countess Lanskoronska, very extremely powerful family. The Raven of Zurich, he knew them all. He knew all the players of Pharaoh's elite during the two world wars and beyond, doing all the wheeling and dealing for them out of Pharaoh's base in the Alps where all their money is, and where they're hiding all their valuables. So here, uh, chapter 39, at page um, 167, it's about here in 1932, the Swiss citizenship, which he gets just, you know, just like that, you know. And here, the page after, 168, uh, on July 30th, 1932, my wife gave birth to a son whom we named Wolfgang in honor of Goethe, another Freemason, and it is Wolfgang von Goethe, nobility, whose anniversary year was being celebrated. He was the second of our children to be born in Zurich. They all became Swissies, and of course, they got all the descendants, got all very powerful uh, jobs everywhere. And my wife and I decided in their interest to take up Swiss citizenship. 
Um, I had not given up my Austrian citizenship throughout the nine years I was in Germany or the 14 years I worked in Switzerland, but now it was, after all, some 23 years since I left uh, uh, Vienna. Actually, afterwards, they after the war, they uh, they even went to America and probably also got um, American citizenship. So, and he says here, you know, he I decided to take up Swiss citizenship. Now, I know after twenty six years of terror in Switzerland, a an immigrant can't decide to take up Swiss citizenship. You know. It's the Swissies who decide if whether or not you're going to get their great Swiss citizenship. Well, I mean, the Swiss slaves, they think they decide, but they don't decide. Because here you can see this is the pharaoh's nobility who can say, I decide, not the Swiss decide nothing. And in fact, both for the pharaoh's nobility, like the raven here, and for immigrants from other countries, the slif, the uh, the Swissies, uh, the slaves of Switzerland themselves are are just are just a plain nuisance. More and more to Pharaoh's nobility as well, and in the end, they don't decide anything. Just they're just thinking that they're deciding themselves and being the masters of Switzerland, which they are far, far from being that. You know, they are, um, they are the slaves of uh, of Pharaoh's bays, you know, and who went through a lot of poverty as well. So here it's funny to see this. I decided to take up Swiss citizenship. Me, homie Ross, I was an immigrant like in Switzerland. They never gave me, a, uh, they gave me so much of a hassle and terror, put me in prison. Uh, because they didn't want to give me a a Swiss um, a permit to be there. They said, "No, you're illegal here and all that." You know, and this guy just said, "Oh, oh, I decided to take up Swiss citizenship for me and my counter's wife and my children." You know, I decided, yes. So, you know. And me, homie Ross, I can't even see my children grow up. My, and my children don't even have their dad, you know. So you see, you know, it's 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 a two-way laws, you know, especially in Switzerland, you know. It's really the base of the elite who can do whatever they want. They're above all the laws. And there's no Swiss slave who can tell them what to do and what not to do. But the Swiss slaves, they can say it of a, to a normal and about a normal immigrant like homie Ross, what he should do and what he can't do, you know. It's mostly about what he can't do, yeah. So this is how it works here. And I, I just read it here, you know. It's um, Absurdistan in the Alps, yeah. As the raven was both a banker and pulling strings in politics and most of all behind the politics, he could say things like, the state alone is responsible for inflation. Inflation without government, or indeed against government, is impossible. Well, he could say this because he knew exactly of what people all the governments in the world consisted of. His own clan or Pharaoh's nobility deciding whether yes or no an inflation would take place to skim the milk and rob the people. Apparently, his memoirs, The Raven of Zurich, were published just after World War II and giving a lot of valuable information about the powers behind the screens and their base Switzerland in the Alps, not knowing that many years later there would be a certain Homi Ross and a thing called the Internet, analyzing this very dangerous information about the ones in power and their main base in the Alps. 
the Raven of Zurich. <laughs>